Okay. Okay. All right. Well, thank you very much, uh, Nadine. And it's great to be back at wonderful um, Hewlett Woodmere Library. So, even though I'm sitting here in my um, former bedroom now, home office, I still feel like I'm back among all of you people out there at, um, at the library. So, just a little catch up. Today we are doing Angkor Wat, The Lost City of Ghosts. And check your uh, newsletter for updates. We have September 14th scheduled where I will be talking about another lost city of ghosts. And that is going to be Petra in Southern Jordan where Israel, Saudi Arabia and Jordan all meet together. Fascinating city, abandoned city, that is great. And that will once again be on Zoom. And then beginning in October, uh, the library is planning to go back to um, um, having meetings at the library. But once again, a lot can happen between now and um, October. So, we have scheduled October 5th is going to be on the wonderful world of voodoo. And then November 9th is going to be about New York City, about the gods, the prophets, the messiahs of New York, whether it is the Menachem Schneerson, the messiah. Actually, it's November, it's uh, December 7th. November. The 9th, no, December 7th. December 7th, yes. I'm talking about November 9th. That's when we have. Sorry. Excuse me. Just said sorry. Oh, okay. Yeah. On, on November 9th will be um, the God's Prophets, uh, Nation of Islam, Lubavitchers, Veronica Lucan, and people of New York who have really left their mark on religious movements. And then in December 7th, as we are moving into um, the holiday season, we have uh, preceded by Thanksgiving and then Christmas and uh, Hanukkah and New Year's, I'll be doing a program just on the power of holidays. Why do we celebrate holidays? What's the function of holidays and what do they do? So that will be September, October, November, and December. August, of course, I already have my ticket. I'm leaving on the 26th of this month for Paris and then down to Avignon and down to Marseille and then over to Spain, Barcelona. So I will be gone. You'll some have, somehow have to get through August without hearing from me. But the promise is that I will be back uh, for Petra on September 14th. So regarding whether it's going to be on Zoom or um, at the library, definitely uh, check the latest update with the library because uh, and the newsletter, because nobody really knows what's going to be happening in the fall. And I'll tell you for sure, even Toro College, where I teach, we still don't know what's going to be in um, September when theoretically we're supposed to go back to classes. So uh, it's really um, up in the air. OK, so. Once again, I'm sure most of you know me. Uh, this is Ron Brown, uh, Dr. Ronald Brown. I teach history, political science, uh, ethnic studies, history of New York at Toro College. We have a campus here in Queens at Forest Hills. And that is where I do my teaching. Although uh, last semester it was all on Zoom and the fall, it is still pretty much up in the air. So I'm broadcasting to you live from the middle of Queens, Elmhurst. You may remember Elmhurst. This was ground zero, the Elmhurst Hospital with the pandemic and everything. So I was right in the middle of it. Well, today we're not going to the Elmhurst Hospital. We're going to the wonderful city of Angkor Wat in the middle of Cambodia, the lost city of ghosts. First, what we will do is we will talk about the importance of and the continuity of, oops, let me go back, of sacred cities. Then we'll talk about those who built Angkor Wat. They were the Hindus from India. 
the rise of the Khmer Empire, 1802-1431, one of the great empires of South Asia, and then the rediscovery of Angkor Wat. It's in a plain covered with trees and jungle, and people sort of forgot that this magnificent city was there and its rediscovery. The featuring of Angkor Wat by the French in the Paris World's Fair of 1878. And then a little bit about my travels to Thailand and how I got to um, Cambodia. So, now when we talk about sacred cities in general, as we talked about Jerusalem, for example, I mean, it was the Jebusite sacred city, a walled powerful city, the last city of the land of Cana to be conquered and occupied by the invading Hebrew tribes. It was only King David who was finally able to conquer Salem, as it was called by the Jebusites, and turn it into the capital of the kingdom of Israel. Well, there's a continuity there from the Jebusites to the Hebrews, and then, of course, the Christians took over under the Byzantine Empire. Then the Muslims took over and turned it into their most third most sacred city. Jerusalem features in the Christian Bible as the place where the end of the world is going to begin and Jesus the Messiah will return. So I'm sure that the aliens are planning some new chapter to the sacred city of Jerusalem, adding an alien dimension. So some cities are sacred, and they remain so throughout history, constantly reinventing themselves. For example, Rome. It was the holy city, the great capital of the Roman Republic. Then it became, under Augustus, the capital of the Roman Empire. Then the Roman Empire fell and the Catholics took over. It became the capital of the Roman Catholic Church. Mussolini took the city and turned it into the capital of his new Roman Empire. So that's why they call it eternal Rome, because it continues to be a very important city. Well, there are some cities that have no history. They rise, they flourish, they fall, and they disappear. And that would be Machu Picchu, where I've gone to twice up in the top of the mountains in Peru, a city that is today, as you can see from the picture, at the top of the world, totally abandoned, had one brilliant golden age under the Inca Empire, and then disappeared. Tenochtitlan in Mexico remains a city of pyramids and lakes and temples going back thousands of years, but was mysteriously abandoned. And even today is on the outskirts of Mexico City. So I've always found such lost empire cities as fascinating. Whenever I hear about one, I always go off and I want to visit it. So Stenestetlan, Machu Picchu, but there are still a lot more cities to visit. The great Zimbabwe, we see in, in modern Zimbabwe, the former British colony of Rhodesia, a lost stone city in the middle of the jungle. Nobody knows who built it. Nobody knows when it was built but it was the capital of a great lost empire. Mohenjo-daro in Pakistan, the capital of the Indus Valley civilization. The islands in the Pacific, such as Easter Island with its strange statues. Ur, the city of Abraham, lost in the uh, sands of modern day Iraq. Atlantis, of course. Now, there, that's going to be a field trip for me some January to go into the bottom of the Atlantic and find the lost city of Atlantis. And at the bottom, you see me down in the Yucatan exploring lost, abandoned Maya temples, lost in the jungle, completely forgotten until 
They were rediscovered. The trees were chopped down. The temples were restored. We don't know what civilization built them, how long it lasted. We know very little about it. And we know even less about why was it abandoned. When I was in Paraguay, I went searching for the famous lost city of Z, which is somewhere on the Paraguay, Uruguay, and Brazilian jungles. Many people have lost their lives, gone into the jungles looking for the lost city of Z. Even films were made, such as on the bottom right, books were written. Nobody has found it yet. Even in the United States, we have a lost city of Roanoke. What happened to it? Where did the people go? Did they disappear? All kinds of theories. The lost city of the Kalahari Desert in South Africa, another lost and largely forgotten city. So where does Angkor Wat fall into this big story? Well, Angkor Wat has an interesting history. If you look at the bar map at the bottom where you see the word steps, that is the origin of the Indo-European peoples. One branch went west and they became Germans and French and Greeks and Italians and French and Spanish and Vikings and British. Another group migrated around 2000 BC, BCE. They migrated east and they became the Persians, the Armenians, the Georgians and the peoples of India. So that's why we call it the Indo-European migration. There you always see steppes that is today modern Ukraine and Russia, which is the homeland of the white race. Well, we also call them the Aryan peoples, the West Aryans in Europe and the East Aryans. The picture on the top, you see the Germanic peoples, the Celtic peoples, the Italians, the Greeks, the Anatolians are one branch. The Iranians, the Armenians, and the Indo-Europeans are another branch. So we are first cousins to the people who established the great empires of the Indus Valley and of India. Until today, the people of Northern India are tall, brown-haired, very often blue-eyed, very light skin. The original inhabitants of India are at the southern part. They are called the Dravidian peoples, and they are shorter, very dark skin, and speak not non-Indo-European languages. Well, the Indo-Europeans migrated into India and conquered the peoples, and they blended the religion of ancient India together with the religions of the Aryans. And this became known as the um, empire of the Hindus. And so you see India produced a great culture in the first and sixth centuries sending out missionaries, traders, businessmen from Afghanistan and Persia, the whole way down to the Philippines, Indonesia, Malaysia. And wherever these Hindu peoples went, they built giant temples, such as the one which we see on the right, which is very similar to Angkor Wat, the great temple complexes of Burma, southern Vietnam, Indonesia, Malaysia, and even up into the Philippines. Hindus had a multitude of deities. Every river had its deity. Every mountain had its deity. Uh, every town had its god of the town. And it was a, a very uh, pluralistic religious expression. The caste system put the Aryans, the light-skinned people from modern-day Russia, were at the top. They were the Brahmin peoples. The main languages of India today are Sanskrit-based, which is very similar to Latin and Greek and German and French and Russian and 
Persian. Many of the words are the same between the languages of India and German or English. They wrote their great legendary histories, the Vedas, the creation of the world, the role of the gods, very similar to the Jewish um, Bible, commonly called the Old Testament, talking about the creation of the world, the first humans and all that kind of stuff. Well, sacred for Hindus was Mount Meru, sometimes called Sumeru, which is in northern India. This was the abode of the gods. And you see the picture of these sheer mountain cliffs, almost impossible to climb. This was the Mount Athos of the Hindu civilization, the abode of the gods. So wherever Hinduism spread, they took the mountain with them, sort of a portable mountain. They built temples, which were always dominated by sacred geography. Mount Meru is the tallest temple in Angkor Wat and in the temples of Indonesia. So gods, as you see in the picture on the right, were uh, lived on the earth. They lived in the mountains, but their homeland, their holy homeland was Mount Meru, which is today in northern India. Well, other great lost cities of this great Hindu civilization are, for example, in Bali and in Indonesia, always building sacred mountains, the reincarnation of Mount Meru, taking the abode of the gods with you, just like Christians call a church the house of God. That's why Christians and Jews always leave a lamp burning in a synagogue or a church to show that even if nobody's there, somebody is home. And so the Hindus did it as well by building a mountain, thinking that the gods might just use it as a vacation spot. And so Angkor Wat could be compared to sort of uh, the Hamptons, of the Hindu pantheon of the gods. So the architecture of Bali and Indonesia, of Machu Picchu, uh, of uh, Angkor Wat are all mountain oriented. I love the picture at the bottom on the left, which shows a mountain peak, but it's cut through the middle and it becomes almost like an archway. Now the Bali temples go back beginning in the year 500, lasting until 1400, when Indonesia, Malaysia, uh, Cambodia were all part of this ancient Islam, um, Hindu civilization. But Ubedor again in Indonesia, once again showing the sacred mountain peaks of the Himalaya mountains, the largest one being Mount Meru. Even when they look temple-like, they are still recreations of Mount Meru. Well, when the Hindus took over what is today, Thailand and Cambodia, most of Vietnam, Laos, they brought their Hinduism with them. And they built their great empires and temples, all inspired by Hinduism. The Khmer Empire, you may remember the name Khmer Rouge of the communist era. Well, Khmer is the actual name of Cambodia. When the French took it over, they couldn't pronounce Khmer very well, so it became Cambodia, but it was the Khmer Empire. And beginning in the year 800s, beginning in what is today Cambodia, the empire spread, taking over the Mekong Delta, which is Vietnam, taking over most of Thailand up into Burma and spreading down into what is today Singapore and Indonesia. Well, this was a Hindu empire and they built their giant temples such as Angkor Wat and many books have been written such as Stories in Stone uh, talking about the great temple complexes 
of the Khmer Empire. The capital of the Khmer Empire was, of course, Angkor Wat. And from the 800s until the 1400s, Angkor Wat was the capital of this great empire. Once again, you see it on the left. Thailand, Cambodia, Laos, large parts of Vietnam, and down into what is today modern day uh, Malaysia, even expanding into what is today India and uh, uh, um, um, other areas on its border. Now the temple complex, as you can see from the picture on the right, is once again dominated by reproductions of the Himalaya mountains. The sacred mountain, Mount Meru, recreated in stone. There are all kinds of legends of the gods of India leaving Mount Meru and appearing to people in these giant mountain-like temples. So it was a portable type of religion. Wherever the Hindus settled, they built imitation Mount Meru, they built the mountain peaks which surrounded it, and they beckoned the Hindu gods, come on down, spend a vacation, even stay here for a while. Well, the greatest king, one of the earliest great kings of the Khmer Empire, who largely responsible for building Angkor Wat, was King Jayavarman II, who ruled from 770 to 850. And in 802, he declared himself the king of the world, firmly believing that like the Chinese, who believe that China is the middle kingdom, he said that the Khmer kingdom is now the center of the world. And Angkor Wat, was at one time, and scholars believe it was the largest city on the face of the earth. And you see the typical features of the Khmer people, very large fleshy lips, slanted eyes, Asian looking, always with a smile, and they would create temples adorned with the kings and with their families. The greatest contributions to the capital were made by uh, Suryavanam II, who ruled from 1113 to 1150. Now remember, in Europe, these years are called the European Dark Ages, medieval world, which was a period, most people consider it as a period of decline a period between the flourishing Roman Empire and the Italian Renaissance. In the middle was the Age of Darkness, so-called Dark Ages. Well, Angkor Wat and the Khmer Empire were definitely not in the Dark Ages. This was a time of glorious architectural monuments, carvings into stone, recording the kings, and the royal families and the great military adventures who uh, dominated the world. Now, it was this king, Suryavanam II, who gave Angkor Wat its present um, visual incarnation. In the year 1010, it was the largest city in the world. Here again, we don't have statistics and that, but don't forget, um, it was the Byzantine Empire that was ruling the Middle East. Uh, the Roman Empire had collapsed under the invasion of the barbarians, and uh, it was the Dark Ages. So uh, no other place could rival Angkor or what which we do know a lot about from the so-called Middle Ages. Now, the central point on this map, you can see Angkor Om, and below it is the Angkor Wat Temple Complex. Angkor, which means temple, 
Uh, the Angkor Wat was the religious temple, like the Vatican, and Angkor Thom was a giant square with administrative buildings. The emperor lived there. And on either side were giant pools, the West and the East Beret. Now, the, fa the thing that you notice when you go to Angkor Wat is it is totally flat. And when it rains, the whole area is covered with a foot or two of water. So the only way that the area can be made habitable is building giant pools to drain the water and to leave dry land for the farmers and for building temples. So it is an area with a very, very delicate ecosystem. In fact, in many ways, it reminds me of Amsterdam, where you see all of the canals. Well, the Dutch didn't build canals because they liked canals. They built canals to drain the water from the swamps and allow them enough free land, stable land, dry land, for both agriculture and business. So that's why Amsterdam is filled with canals. Well, Angkor Wat was the same thing, much like Venice, a city of canals to drain the water away, liberate land for homes and temples and churches and what not, and make it a habitable area. So it is, until today, swampy area. If you want to see mosquitoes the size of a small automobile, go to Angkor Wat. It is infested with mosquitoes the size I have never seen. And when you lather yourself with bug repellent, you get the feeling the mosquitoes are going around your head laughing at you, saying, oh, that stupid American, thinking you can beat a, a Cambodian mosquito. But this is the layout of the town. Now, of course, for centuries, the area was completely covered with trees, swamps, the, the barres were filled in with junk and debris, and most of it was underwater, or the temples were totally covered over with jungle vines and trees. And so it really became a lost city. If you look at the picture on the right, you see the temple complex, the central complex, with Mount Meru in the middle, surrounded by the peaks of the Himalayas. But if you look beyond that, you see that every temple complex, which has been freed from the forest, is completely surrounded still by jungles. And you abandon the smallest area of Angkor Wat, and you get the impression that within weeks, the temple will be completely completely covered over with vines and trees. Now the Hindu cosmology is geometric. You can see it's all rectangles, it's all squares. You have central Mount Meru with four other mountains around it and another four further out and a square which was considered the heavenly layout, very similar to um, the um, imperial city, forbidden city of uh, um, uh, Peking. Once again, the square does not exist in nature. The triangle and the circle do not exist in nature. These are intellectual constructs. So when you create squares and rectangles within squares and rectangles, you are transforming nature from the natural wild forest. You are transforming it into an intellectual creation because it was believed that the mind should dominate the world. In fact, the Jewish Bible says, God created the world and he gave humans dominion over it to name everything and to build square buildings, rectangular buildings, such as the great temple of Jerusalem, the temples of Ur and Babylon and Egypt and even the Vatican, squares, rectangles and perfect circles. This is called the sacred geography, where you 
impose the mind on wild, unruly nature. This is the tourist map that they give you. You see the East Barre has been restored and is now a, a, a reflecting pool. The West Barre is being gradually um, restored. You see Angkor Wat, the temple complex at the bottom and Angkor Tom, the administrative complex. But you don't have to go very far off of the main roads and you stumble upon still another temple complex and the vast majority have not even been explored or restored because there are just so many of them. It's recorded that there are 1,000 known temple complexes. This is the main temple complex of Angkor Wat. Once again, see the rectangle with Mount Meru in the middle, a square island linked with north and south bridges with a moat, a pool around it. Once again, to drain the water so that you can have dry land. But even look at it, even around the temple, you don't have to go very far from the temple and you are in the mosquito and monkey and snake infested forest. But it is very, very flat. So you can get up to the top of a temple and you get the impression you can see forever. So of the thousand temples, only a handful have been restored. Here we see the Angkor Thom gate. And there you see the visage of the Hindu god Vishnu uh, peering out from the stonework. Here again, you have to realize these are over a thousand years old. They were made before they had laser guns and all kinds of modern technology. They did not have the round arch, nor did they use the pointed arch of the Gothic and of the Arabs. They had the pointed arch where stones were gradually brought closer and closer until finally they would meet. And you see the statues of Hindu gods, of Khmer kings and queens and princes and great leaders staring at you with their big thick lips and flat nose, staring out of the temples. Everything in Angkor Wat is covered with history. The top on the left, you see a king returning from battle, riding his, by, uh, his elephant with the roped prisoners below him. Other temples will depict great marriages. The one on the bottom right shows a daily scene of harvesting of agricultural work. We don't have much, if any, writing from the period because you're dealing with a super humid place. Just a word of warning, don't go to Angkor Wat in July. Go in the middle of winter, go in January when I was there because then the weather is tolerable. But everything is covered with scenes of daily life, not painted, but carved into the stones. Religious scenes of Hinduism, the battles of great leaders, the families of the kings and emperors, uh, their wives, their children, all recorded in very beautifully um, uh, sculpted um, walls. Now this tree, I'm sure a lot of you are speaking with me today, have this very same tree in your apartment growing in a nice pot. This is the ficus tree, which you can buy at any store here. But as long as it stays in the pot, it puts all of its roots back into the same soil. But if you would put this tree out into a garden, its roots would branch out and take over your entire house. Now, this is one of the big problems of why it's so difficult to restore so many of these temples, because the roots of the tree have penetrated into the building. 
And if you would kill the tree and take out the roots, in many cases, you would end up destroying the temple itself. And every 10 minutes, it seems, another ficus tree is poking its nose from out between the rocks and ready to grow to great size. So you have to constantly maintain these temples against the forces of nature. And the worst is the roots of these trees that, well, uh, seed will fall anywhere. It will grow and send roots down into the ground seeking water. Well, Angkor Wat has been the symbol of the new Cambodian state. It's on the money, it's on stamps, it's on the national flag, the medal in the middle given to great heroes of Cambodia, of course, features its ancient imperial capital. So for Cambodians, Angkor Wat is like Jerusalem is to Jews. It is like Rome is to Catholics or like for the Orthodox Christians, it would be Constantinople, modern day Istanbul. So everywhere you go, you see plastic models, sort of like the Statue of Liberty in New York. You can buy big ones, small ones, plastic ones, solid gold ones, crystal ones, pictures, paintings, mosaics, you name it. It is everywhere. Well, the Khmer Empire began to endure the arrival of the Europeans. Ever since Vasco da Gama sailed around South Africa and revealed to Europe that you could travel around South Africa, go up and you were in the Indian Ocean, you were in the Bay of Bengal, and so, the Europeans, beginning with the Portuguese and the Spanish and then the British and the French, started going to Asia and carving out empires. Well, the Kumar Empire by the late 14s and early 1500s was already an ancient empire, a thousand years old on the verge of collapse. Well, there were a lot of people competing for taking over Cambodia. Chinese to the north were expanding with wars against Vietnam, Laos, even down into Thailand and Cambodia. The British recognized uh, their sovereignty over India eventually and considered uh, uh, Burma as one of their big colonies. And they also had their sights on Cambodia. But it was a mixture. It had a Chinese, large Chinese population. A lot of Hindus are still in Cambodia, even if the majority today are Buddhists. The Muslims were expanding from East Africa, building settlements. And until today, there are mosques all over Cambodia. Well, the big contesters for control of Cambodia were the French, the English. The French took over Vietnam, Laos, and gradually gobbled up Cambodia. The English took over India, Bangladesh, and Burma. Thailand was the only country in Southeast Asia that managed to play off the French and the English, and then later the Americans and the Japanese, and remain independent. But Cambodia fell eventually to the uh, French. Until today, as you can see, Islam made major inroads and the capital, not, not Angkor Wat, but Phnom Penh and the coastal cities were largely taken over by Muslim traders as the Muslim empire expanded from modern day Saudi Arabia to Morocco and down into South Asia many Cambodians ended up converting to Islam. And there you see a picture of a mosque uh, in Cambodia. Now, even though the temples of Angkor Wat were built by Hindus and commemorated the Hindu gods like Vishnu, the spread of Buddhism from India, its homeland, down into Burma, Thailand, Cambodia, and Vietnam, 
basically took over Angkor Wat and they would put in a statue of the Buddha in the Hindu temples. So when you go around, you see these magnificent Hindu temples celebrating the sacred Hindu mountain, Mount Meru, but there anybody associated with religion these days would be a Buddhist monk. And they have set up monasteries and convents in various areas of Angkor Wat. Well, gradually, the Spanish, the French, the Dutch, the English, and later the Americans started carving up the Middle East. The Americans took the Philippines in the Spanish-American War. The English took Malaysia and Burma. The Dutch took Indonesia. The French took Vietnam, Laos, and Cambodia. And so Cambodia fell under the French influence. Well, Thailand, at times a major empire, gradually managed to keep most of its territory while the French took big chunks of it and the English took chunks of it. Thailand was the only country that managed to resist the European expansion. The French carved out what they called their French Indochina. Cambodia, Vietnam, and Laos. And Thailand, or formerly called Siam, remained independent. Well, today, who's going to control Cambodia is mainly a toss up between the Americans and the Chinese. The Vietnam War spilled over into Cambodia, and the United States had a puppet government in South. South Vietnam. It also had a puppet government in Cambodia. Well, the Americans eventually lost the war and Cambodia again became independent. Today's big threat is, of course, the Chinese. You see the map South China Sea. Um, and China is claiming all of the islands in the South China Sea. And economically, Cambodia is dominated more and more by the Chinese. You rarely see Americans over there. It has now become a colony or a protectorate of China. Well, Angkor Wat, with the decline of the Khmer Kingdom, was generally abandoned. And with the foreigners trying to take over Cambodia, the coastal cities became important, such as Phnom Penh, the capital, which is further toward the coast. And so Angkor Wat was forgotten, completely covered over with uh, vines and trees. Its so-called rediscovery happened in the late 50s. When the Portuguese were carving out their colonial empire in Brazil and in Africa and uh, up in Macau and ch in China, they also started exploring Cambodia. The person credited with rediscovering this lost city was Antonio de Madalena, who was a Portuguese uh, monk. And he was absolutely blown away by how beautiful it is. He said, it is of such extraordinary construction that it is not possible to describe it with a pen, particularly since it is like no other building in the world. It has towers and decoration and all the refinements with the human genius can conceive of. Well, needless to say, such writings were not politically correct at the age, because in the 1500s, the French, the Spanish, the English were fighting over who was going to control Cambodia. And one of the main justifications that the Europeans gave for both African slavery and colonialism in Asia was these are primitive people, idol worshiping people that need the French civilization. 
the British culture, Spanish Catholicism to civilize these barbarians. So the French were screaming, there are a bunch of uncivilized barbarians. But when the priest wrote back saying they are not barbarians at all, that they have all the refinements of the human genius. He even compared it to the great Catholic cathedrals of Notre Dame and the Vatican itself. Well, this didn't fit very well with the Europeans, but still they couldn't deny that it was true. And so this re rediscovery of Angkor Wat has to be placed in this great age of discovery. When Charles Darwin was sailing around and coming up with the theory of evolution, the French were collecting all the knowledge of the world in their famous encyclopedie. John James Audubon was traversing North America, describing its plants, its animals, its birds, and even its rodents. Alexander von Humboldt in Germany traveled all over South America, rediscovered the cities of the Aztecs, the Mayas, and the Incas. So a lot of exploration was going on and the rediscovery of Angkor Wat showed Europeans that these so-called primitive people, idol-worshipping heathens, as they were often called, actually at one time had a great and very lofty civilization. Henri Mouault, 1826-1861, highlighted his trips through the Kingdom of Siam, of Cambodia, and Laos, writing about the magnificent engineering, architectural skills in building places like Angkor Wat, the drainage systems, which made it possible to take swamps, flat, low-lying swamps, and build giant temples and create, which was in the Middle Ages, the largest city in the world. And so Tang or Wat became a symbol of the high level of civilization that some of these, what we call third world peoples or underdeveloped peoples or primitive barbarians, that they could and they did at one time have great civilizations and even Europeans could learn from them. And he wrote, Mao wrote, that one of the temples rivaled the temple of King Solomon in, Jer in Jerusalem. It rivaled the Vatican of Michelangelo. It rivaled anything that Greece and Rome had ever created. He wrote at Angkor, there were such, there were ruins of such grandeur that at the first view, one is filled with profound admiration and cannot but ask, what has become of this powerful race? So civilized, so enlightened. Who were the authors of these gigantic works? Well, with people like Henri Mouault and uh, uh, Audubon, even Charles Darwin, this was all before the age of the photograph, which only became possible uh, during and following the American Civil War. And so artists would go and they would make sketches. They would make paintings of these magnificent temples. And even here you see Angkor Wat still shrouded on both sides with trees and jungles and monkeys and snakes. But the glory of Angkor Wat started filtering back to Europe. The Paris World's Fair of 1878, that's the one that gave us the Eiffel Tower, where I'm going to be as of July 26. Well, the World's Fair was a celebration of the French Empire. Don't forget, France had just lost the war with rising Prussia. 
Alsace-Lorraine had returned to German control, France was defeated. And so to show that maybe in Europe they were a second rate power, but they were a great world empire. So they featured Angkor Wat as one of the signs of the great world that they were discovering, researching, and learning from. Well, many things were featured, not just African villages, not just the temples of areas of Asia that they had colonized, not just the Statue of Liberty, which France was building for the United States, but the Eiffel Tower, the latest in technology, country villages, and they featured everything that they had to show off to the world. Central to them were Les Ruines d'Angor in Dauchine. In fact, French architects and builders constructed reconstructions of many of the temples of Angkor Wat. Some pieces of stone were transported back to France, but that was a bit more than they could handle at the time. And so they built entire copies of these temples in plaster, what we call today plaster of Paris. The great um, uh, photo, um, paintings, drawings. The one on the left is a photograph that was actually taken during the exposition. Posters featuring the ruins uh, uh, were all um, highly celebrated at the exposition. Here we see some photographs taken inside uh, of the different temples. Um, statues at the bottom on the right were actually taken back to France. Today, another big scandal, should they be returned to their former colony? And it was a celebration of the glory of Angkor Wat. Now this, don't forget, the late 1800s was also the beginning of tourism. And the great travel uh, people of the day, such as Alexander von Humboldt and Darwin, were being followed by the first modern wave of tourism. Uh, I have a wonderful collection of Baedeker travel guides from this period. Uh, I only collect travel guides from before uh, 1900. And so I have one on Cambodia uh, published in Germany. I mean, it's about a couple hundred pages thick and it describes all of the knowledge of where to stay, what restaurants to eat at. But of course, this was luxury tourism of the age. They didn't have the jumbo jets and the hostels where I usually stay. But Angkor Wat started spurring this great travel uh, um, wave that eventually would result in the modern tourism industry. Now, the easiest way to get to Angkor Wat is either to fly to Phnom Penh and to take a bus. Um, Phnom Penh is a relatively modern city. So what I did was on my first, on my trip to Thailand in January 2003, I flew to Bangkok. And there I took, you can see the bus on the right, um, air conditioned going from downtown Bangkok to Phnom Penh, arriving at a hostel, a guest house. It was from seven to nine hours, depending on frontier and weather and everything. Don't forget the whole area is flat. A storm can wipe out bridges and ruin transportation. But the trip when I was there in 2003, um, I paid $22. Uh, but you could take a more luxury bus or even a van for um, up to $250. But it's doable in a day. You arrive in the evening, you get your ticket for the entire complex, which is valid for a couple of days, and you can visit 
the temples. The second time I was at uh, Angkor Wat in Thailand was in 2016, when I was there for the um, uh, funeral of King Rama the Ninth of Thailand. And it was fascinating, his entire funeral cortege, which was a giant mountain made out of wood covered with gold on giant wheels, this cart that took his body from one end of Thailand to the other throughout a year was a reconstruction again of Mount Meru, showing that the Hindu influence is still very strongly present in countries like Cambodia and Thailand. In fact, the king, whose official name was King Rama the Ninth, was named after the Hindu god Ram, and the Thais believe that their king is a reincarnation of uh, the Hindu god Ram. And when King Rama the Ninth died and his body was burned in this giant mountain of, Me uh, of gilded Meru um, cortege, they believe that his soul returned to Mount Meru in India. So this mixture of Buddhism and Hinduism is uh, still very present in Thailand, in Burma, in Cambodia, and to a less extent in Vietnam. And of course, when I was traveling to Angkor Wat, this is the kind of hostel I stayed in. Um, uh, Angkor Wat is becoming quite commercialized. Uh, tourists are everywhere. I don't know how it is now with the uh, COVID-19, but when I was there, there were stores all over. Most of the stores were owned by Chinese. The Chinese are still the commercial class of uh, Cambodia. The stores, the hotels, the hostels, like the one on the right where I stay, were always inevitably owned by Chinese. Well, I stay in these hostels because you can see it's jungle-like, but they have upper decks and the uh, rooms are um, uh, uh, bunk beds. And at the bottom, they have a drawer with a lock on it where you can keep your valuables and everything. And it's a great way to meet people. I met a lot of Indians, uh, people from India, people from China, people from Persia, from Australia, who were visiting Angkor Wat. And we would just sit around, exchange stories, and exchange um, all kinds of uh, travel gossip. So even though Cambodia is today a Buddhist country, Hinduism remains supreme. The Brahmin class, even though you, you meet Buddhists and they will tell you which Hindu caste they belong to, whether they are priests or warriors, kshatriyas or they don't reveal that they're untouchables or out of caste, but Hinduism remains very, very powerful, sort of an underlying cultural uh, mentality that underlies a country which is today ostensibly um, Buddhist. Here we see what I saw in Bangkok for the funeral. You see Mount Meru with its pointed peak in there was the throne of the king when he was alive and would go parading through the streets. At the bottom on the right, you see his funeral temple being built. Once again, a recreation of Mount Meru where his body would be burned and his soul returning to Mount Meru. Above that, we see a picture of King Rama the Ninth, uh, who had just died. And of course, even though he was a good Buddhist, he was still surrounded in this display by the Hindu gods and goddesses. So that concludes our little visit to Angkor Wat, one of those mysterious cities. I'm always looking out for them. 
In fact, I hope that when all these rovers are going to Mars and Jupiter and the moon, maybe on the backside of the moon, if they discover some ancient lost city, I'll be on the first uh, exploration of this city. So when I come back, I'll definitely contact Nadine and she can arrange a, um, um, a Zoom talk on my recent visit to a lost city of something or other on Mars. But for the meantime, I have to explore earthly cities. So once again, you see me here uh, at Fire Island, um, where so many people had such wonderful vacations on Fire Island that when they died, they would have their bodies incinerated and they built a chapel right near the beach where their ashes were put in repose so that they could live in death as they had enjoyed life at Fire Island. On the right, there's another picture of me visiting temples here again, uh, Hindu temples and Buddhist temples, which are uh, very often the same building. So I should have mentioned this early. If anybody has any questions or comments, you know, use the chat line. You should know that uh, by uh, from experience. And uh, if anybody has anything they'd like to uh, communicate with me, just go to ronbrownmedia at gmail.com and I will check periodically and respond. So 